Welcome back for our new season, uh, slightly curtailed as you can see, but we just increased the quality um, this, this year. Um, our guest today, Marilyn Murphy, is a distinguished professor of art here at Vanderbilt with an MFA and a, BF, uh, and, a, uh, and a BFA from University of Oklahoma. She's chaired her department, she's the recipient of many awards and distinctions, and she's curated over 30 exhibitions. Now this would be enough for a successful career, but Marilyn is also an internationally celebrated artist who's honored us by making Nashville her home. Her paintings and drawings have been shown in over 270 ex exhibitions. I don't know how, you, how you've done all that. Uh, from New York to Australia, and they can be found in many public and private collections including the Kemper Collection, the Huntsville Museum of Art, the Boston Museum School, and the Prudential and Bridgestone, Brid Bridgestone Collections. Five years ago, um, some of you will have enjoyed a major retrospective um, exhibition of her work here at, at the Frist, uh, curated by um, Mark Scala, who I think is somewhere in the back. Um, a wonderful exhibition, and her work can be seen currently at the Carl Hammer Gallery in Chicago and at Nashville's Cumberland Gallery, so you can actually find her stuff and, and buy it, uh, I guess, if you're interested. I don't want to stand uh, any longer than necessary between you and the visual feast that Marilyn has in store for you. Just a few words. The, the French philosopher Gaston Bachelard wrote some extraordinary books on the poetics of space, on air and dreams, on, and on the psychoanalysis of fire, just, just to mention a few of them, in which he talks about intimate spaces, about dreams, and about what we might call the elemental imagination. Bachelard was not, to my knowledge, a painter, but I've no doubt he would have delighted in Marilyn Murphy's work which pursues so creatively some of these themes. <coughs> she transports us both into other worlds and back into our own world, looked at through an uncanny lens. Sometimes we don't know which it is. I know that her fire paintings were occasioned by witnessing the controlled burning of the sugarcane crop in Northeast Australia, which makes me wonder about the thin line between imagination where you might sort of fantasize about fire and the power of actual experience when you have it in front of you. Which fire burns brightest? One of the ways in which art can transform actual experience is by focusing on the fleeting, things that would otherwise just disappear very quickly. And this takes a very special kind of eye and a special kind of reflective artistic practice to do justice to these vanishing moments whether it's a gathering storm or a small gesture that someone might make. Marilyn Murphy's paintings, I think, are lessons and experiments in seeing. But it's time I let her speak for herself on echoing Bachelard on air and dreams. Please welcome Marilyn Murphy. Thank you, David. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you for allowing me to uh, show you some really interesting art today. Um, I couldn't resist, let me see if I can get that image back. Oops. No. What? Okay. There it is, yay. Uh, I couldn't resist showing this lunchbox for this series. Um, as David mentioned, in 2004, the Frist Center for the Visual Arts uh, presented a mid-career survey of my work. It was paintings, drawings, and prints that they had uh, brought back from collections from around the country. Uh, it was 24 years of my work. And it was a, a huge honor for me, and it's a beautiful space, as, as you all, I'm sure, know. Uh, but the gift shop made some incredible stuff for sale. 
during that time. And one of them was this lunchbox that had my work on both sides. And as you'll see, I've done a number of sort of edible looking images. Um, now, I have a little disclaimer. Although I've been trained as a visual artist and not in the discipline of philosophy, I would like to talk a little bit about the writings of Gaston Bachelard. I love his work. He lived from 1884 to 1962. He was a postmaster for a number of years. And then he went back to school to study physics and philosophy. Uh, from 1940 to 1962, he was the chair of history and the philosophy of science at the Sorbonne in Paris. Uh, he wrote 23 books on the philosophy of science and the spirit of the imagination. Now, although Bachelard's books particularly discuss poetry and its relationship to the imagination, both Air and Dreams, published in 1943, and The Poetics of Space, published in 1958, have resonated with visual artists since <coughs> they were printed. Now, while Bachelard was particularly interested in how language can unleash the imagination. What intrigues me is his discussion of how writers have used common elements in the environment like the house, clouds, air, space, and fire to be used as personal metaphors by the visual artist. Now, my lecture will include the work of a number of contemporary artists with Nashville ties. So you may even know some of these people. Uh, some live in Nashville. Uh, and I will also show some of my own paintings and drawings that, that I feel have a, a, are relevant to Bachelard's writings and that in part have been inspired by his work. Um, now, Bachelard describes the house as protecting the dreamer and as a shelter for daydreaming. As you can see, he's very poetic in his own writing. Um, the house allows one to dream in peace. This is a painting by Barry Buxcamper. Uh, and the title of this one is Wraith. It's done in acrylics. It's 30 inches tall by 23 inches wide. And it was done in 2001. Uh, the, as you can see, right in the center of the image, there's a small model of Barry's own Green Hills home. And it's pretty much situated on the hillside similar to, to where Barry lives. Um, he loves to garden. And a recurring theme in Barry's work is the control of nature. And you can see that in any number of ways. That's actually a three-dimensional rake that's coming out of the upper right-hand corner. It comes out about six inches. And then you see some other rakes and, and gardening tools, a, a little plastic die raking. And you see the controlled, the twigs controlled into, um, into a um, frame around, around the image. And you can also see bits of wood made into little houses. Um, I, one thing that I think is really interesting, one of many things I think is interesting about this piece is the surface that he's working on is actually hardware cloth. It's, the, it's like chicken wire that you buy at Home Depot. And then he stretched it over a wooden frame and then put layer and layer and layer of gesso on it, or layer of, of plaster, I'm sorry, plaster on it, and then gesso. And you can, if you look at the very bottom of the image, you can see a little bit of that peeking through. Uh, so you can actually feel the work. This is one of my paintings. It's about the same size. It was from a series of black and white paintings that I did that were about the joy of work. And it's about the same size as Barry's. It's 30 inches tall by 24 wide. Now my idea for this, my intention, was that here's this woman who looks like a 1950s uh, nutritionist mm -hmm. doing something special in the kitchen. Uh, my idea was uh, my now husband Wayne Roland Brown and I had just got had gotten together 
and we were making a home. We were also wanting to buy a house. I was living at the time in a wonderful old Sterling Court apartment building. It's just ancient, it's fabulous, but I wanted a house. And I, as you can see, I was thinking of 37212, uh, but we actually didn't end up in that zip code. So I had a solo show in St. Louis and I was giving a gallery talk and I was explaining the meaning behind the work. And a woman said, oh no, she's not. That woman is sick of cleaning up after her family, <laughs> picking up socks, doing the dishes, what, you know, scrubbing, and she's gonna take that house and she's gonna shove it in the oven and burn it up. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, that's right, I'm sure. <laughs> so, so really the meaning of an artwork can change or be different depending on the viewer's own experiences. And that is one of my favorite things about dealing with recognizable imagery. Uh, I'll show you two more. Uh, these are two of my graphite drawings, uh, very recent. Um, the one on the left is the architect. The one on the right is time jumper. And as you can see, you can see the same house in both images. I love mid-century modern. And we live in a mid-century modern house. And you can also see, if you look at the very bottom of the, of the image on the right, you can see a tiny corner of the house that I grew up in, in Tulsa, which was also mid-century. Um, and also, just an aside, if you guys have a free Monday evening, you should really go see the Time Jumpers at the Station Inn. They're fabulous. But it's also, it's also about time. And I also like to make references to time as well in my work. Um, the title of this one is Night Winds Over Tulsa. It's 48 inches by 60 inches, and it's in the Tennessee State Museum collection, as well as, uh, as the preliminary drawing for it. Um, it's in oil, and it's, I always thought this place would be a great house and I would love to live in this house in this location. But in fact, it's the very first gas station in Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> with a dome and minarets. How interesting is that? <laughs> um, built in the 20s, and there's a lot of Art Deco in Tulsa, and I've used a lot of that in my work. Uh, but I did this about the same time that I was um, received the honor of being uh, chair of the art and art history department at Vanderbilt. So I had had a whole series of images planned of people, uh, people who were uh, communicating sort of physically with their hands and so on. When I became chair, I started doing quiet night scenes with a lot of falling paper. <laughs> and it was mainly because of the paperwork, but um, I, they could also, as I worked with that image, uh, they could be secrets, they could be knowledge. Uh, there are a lot of different, different things that they could be. Now, Bachelard dis divides poets into four classifications uh, by their response to celestial blue. There are those who see the sky as a flowing liquid that come to life with the smallest cloud. There are those who see the blue sky as an enormous flame, and others who see it as a painted vault. And my personal favorite, those who can participate in the aerial nature of the celestial blue. And what uh, the painting you're looking at now is, what? is by uh, Ron Porter. It's entitled Small World. It's 24 inches high by 52 inches long, and it's oils on panel. It was done in 2001, and he's one of my cherished colleagues at Vanderbilt. He's an incredible painter, incredible uh, professor as well. Uh, Ron says this is a self-portrait, <laughs> and he says as we become older, we all become more self-contained, uh, which can be both a plus and a minus. 
In Aaron Dreams, Bachelard talks about the notion of a suspended island. I couldn't believe it when I read it and had to run to Ron Xerox the book. He had already done this piece. But Bachelard feels like it relates to dreams of flying, transcending the earth with a light that both carries and cradles the dreamer. Um, and I love the way it seems to be lumbering through space. You can kind of see the roots, like it's definitely moving in that direction, but very slowly. This is a sculpture of concrete wire and casting resin entitled The Cloud Carrier by Joan Hageman. It was done in 2009. Uh, Joan pulls her imagery from nature, balancing motifs of fragility and resilience, or nature and the man-made. Uh, she often uses bits and pieces of discarded metal that she finds on farms in Middle Tennessee. Um, she received her master's in English and then spent several years of teaching in the States and two years in the Peace Corps in Africa before turning her, her poems and her, her creative writing into visual art. She does wonderful work. Uh, this is one of my works. Uh, this is one from a, a recent series. This is uh, pie, the Pie Wrangler. Let me get that arrow out of here. Um, one of the most important things to me that one of my professors said was, I, you know, I was in my first painting class and I was kind of I'm just working like a bee, putting in this blue sky, just painting the, like house painting almost. And he said, come here, look at that sky. What color is that? How many colors are in that sky? And I, I really looked at it and it, my jaw dropped because there were hundreds of colors in it. And so it's kind of hard to see in this projection, but there are a lot of colors in that sky. And I've always thought it would be awfully nice to be able to fly with it completely unaided and occasionally have dreams that way. Uh, but I'd also really love to see a p piece of chocolate pie that large as well. <laughs> art, art doesn't have to be about reality. Uh, this is documentary evidence. And you might, as some of you may recognize, that's an old Polaroid camera. Um, this is entitled The Getaway. And uh, as you can see, it was one of my falling papers images. And uh, here she is trying to just scamper out of there. But imagine going over a fence in high heels and a skirt. That's hard work. I'm sure the ladies can imagine. But uh, in this one, the falling paper really has a lot of kind of symbolic. I've got a lot of symbolism within the paper. The post, you see a few little pieces that are tacked onto the post. That's from a northern Renaissance, straight out of a northern Renaissance painting from the 16th century. And then you can also see some little papers that are lying almost flat with one corner kind of curled up. That's a reference to one of my favorite printmakers, Hokusai, a Japanese, uh, he did a drawing with a lot of beautiful falling paper that I was unaware of until one of my colleagues in art history pointed it out. And then you can also see a little paper airplane. And it, that is a reference to my completely flight-obsessed family. My Mom could fly a plane before she could drive a car. She didn't care about driving. My dad was with the airlines for 44 years before he retired. And my brother now has his pilot's license. Uh, there's also a book for knowledge. And here's one, here's another one. This, this is very recent. This is Adrift. Um, this is a painting, and I'm sorry, the colors are kind of washed out a little bit on this uh, because of the video projection, but it's, it's a knockout painting. Um, Bachelard says the most potent images have a history and a prehistory, as well as a blend of memory and legend. And toying with realistic elements within an artwork, like the development of space, 
or the scale of an object can really change a viewer's visual experience. This is a painting by Andrew Wynn entitled Gusher, and it was done in 2009. It's about five or six feet square. It's a big one. And he's really known for his large, large abstract paintings that really allude to space without actually showing you any real objects. What I, this one I found really compelling because it kind of looked like a fortress or the Great Wall or something down below that had been graffitied apparently. And then all these, these round green shapes kind of bubbling up. Are they balloons? Is it bubbles? Is it, what, you know, what in the world is it? But then the blue almost looks like the sky is in front of these things that are bubbling up. Uh, Andrew Wynn received his MFA at the University of Georgia and he is now living in Huntsville, Alabama. Here's another one by Barry Buxcamper. This is Lawn Care Chronicles Hedge Clipper. And get this, this is a watercolor. He is intense with watercolors, rich blacks, rich deep spaces, you know, vibrant colors. But he's, he really likes to play with space from what I've noticed. This was done in 2008. It's tw about 24 inches square. Now, the, I think, you know, we see this tiny little baboon and this huge hedge clipper. And it's, it's kind of interesting because it looks like the plants have triumphed over the hedge clipper. And um, I asked him, I said, you know, what in the world are you thinking about with all these baboons? And he said that he was really interested in the wild exotic nature of the baboons and our genetically close relationship to them. Now, and he said, if humans vanished, would they figure out how to use these tools at, to cultivate their bananas? <laughs> so, and he is going to be having a show opening at Cumberland Gallery in, I think about, is, I think it's on the 17th or something, it's a weekend. Uh, and it's, I highly recommend it. I've seen the work at my framer. We both go to the same framer. And the, his watercolors are just be even better than ever. And they, are, they all don't have baboons. Um, this is uh, uh, another one of my pretty recent ones. This one is The Observers. And um, it was playing with scale, but also about looking. Um, it's, uh, we see two men uh, examining an observatory. That, so I've actually done a series of images uh, that I could probably do a show with now, but they've been kind of sporadic through through the last 20 years of, of people looking and the act of seeing. I teach, one of my favorite classes to teach at Vanderbilt is drawing. And it's so much fun to get people in there who don't know anything about drawing. They know which end of the pencil to use, even though they're all smart people. But I can really teach them to see, and that's what drawing is all about. It's learning to look, analyze, and get it down. But also use your imagination. So that, that personal analysis is kind of what this is about. This is the seamstress in one of my drawings. Uh, this one is, is about the imagination. My mom was an amazing seamstress. This isn't her, but it is her hands. Um, so is that a thunderhead with lightning hitting her needle, or is that the spirit of the imagination? And this is the jello incident. <laughs> I figured there's always room for jello. Um, now, uh, in 1938, Bachelard wrote a book curiously entitled The Psychoanalysis of Fire. And fire can have complex meanings within an image. Uh, it can purify, it can warm, it can cook food nicely, or it can burn your home down. So I'm, here I'm showing a painting by Leonard Kozianski, 
uh, which is actually in the Vanderbilt Art Collection, and I'd love to see it more. It's a large painting, and it's entitled Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. And there's, a, I think, a wonderful balance between the fire and water. There's, you see this, this waterfall coming down on the right in a big splash, and then you see this rock formation coming down with fire at the base. And they're almost identical in shape, but they're absolutely opposites. Um, I, he used to teach, uh, he taught for a number of years at the University of Tennessee, and then he's now in Maryland. Now here in my painting, Oasis, it's 48 inches tall by 36 inches wide. Uh, it was done in 2008. I'm exploring the dualities, both conceptually and formally, uh, safety and danger, peace and turmoil, fire and water, um, strong highlights, deep shadows, uh, fire and water as well. Uh, but the fire you see in the background, David mentioned that uh, w just an amazing experience for me was to see the burning of the cane fields uh, just prior to harvest in northern Queensland in Australia. And they're, ki they're not really doing that so much anymore because it's tough on the environment, um, as you might imagine. But uh, they would t burn off all the leaves and get rid of all the critters in the fields and then they would harvest the cane. And so it's a controlled fire and it's really interesting to see those fires. The, the uh, farmer, I guess, would take this can with a little flame and just walk along the edge of the field and this thing would flame up like crazy. Uh, 12 foot cane, uh, 10, 12 feet, and then the fire above it, and the sound was astonishing. So I felt I had to use it. I've used it many times, and this is a, a current use of it. And I'll show you another one that's a little bit older, but, but is this an oasis? Will this burn, or is that, is that just on the other side of that little smoke wall? and it won't come anywhere near the two cabanas. Uh, this is one of the, my earlier uh, paintings. It, this was in the show at the Frisk. Um, this is 48 inches by 36 inches, and this is entitled Lawn Bowlers. And it's 60 inches, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, I already told you the size. Um, but I've also done a whole series, as it turns out, of images through the years, here and there, that I could put a show together of. They're games, curious games. And um, this is one of them. I thought lawn bowling, how peculiar and wonderful. Uh, and one of the nice things, about, one of the great things about being an artist is that you can research anything you want. I've gone to the National Severe Storms Laboratory and talked to, talked to the meteorologists there. I've, I've gone to Napier, New Zealand to see um, the remarkable Art Deco architecture. And so you can go anywhere and do anything and it's, it's all good. Now this one is actually entitled Air and Dreams and it was in, in as an homage to uh, Bachelard. Uh, <clears throat> this was done in 2008, and this one and the Oasis were in a show in my gallery in Chicago. Um, this is 60 inches by 36, so it's a, pr it's a pretty good sized painting. But you have the calm twilight on the left, and then you have the cane fire on the right. And so kind of playing with that, strong light, two light sources. Um, and I will say that my husband and I get along great, so don't read anything into this. <laughs> and to, to end my, my, uh, my PowerPoint lecture here, <clears throat> this is, um, I'm going to end with two day of my dangerous desserts. And uh, don't try this at home. These were in a, a show called Small Packages at Cumberland that they usually have in November. And they're just little guys. They're little tiny paintings, this large. 
Um, <clears throat> and I, I also really like those big fireworks stores between here and Atlanta. They're just too much fun. Bachelard says that art should be an increase of life, a sort of competition of surprises that stimulates our consciousness and keeps us from becoming drowsy. Uh, other than my own work, I've shown you a few of the really, just a few of the really interesting artists that are based here in Nashville. We have a large, diverse, and exciting art community. Um, there are a lot of places to see art. There's a big gallery crawl on Saturday, I don't know, first Saturdays, I think it is. The first Thursdays, there's a different set of galleries. The wonderful Frist, there are, uh, the Tennessee State Museum, there are all kinds of great places to see art. And all different types of artists, from artists that make objects to artists that play with time and space. Uh, so it, and you, you really have no idea how great it is. I don't even know how, how deep it is anymore. It's really changed, developed, and grown. So get out and have a look. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, do you want the mics down? No, I'm sorry. Right. That's good. Okay. Um, so at this point, I want to just ask um, Marilyn one or two questions to get the discussion going, and then we'll open this to the floor. Um, you know, a couple of things that you were saying about, uh, or from Bachelard, really interested me about it's a general problem about, about painting, which I, I, I've not sort of sorted out completely in my own head, and I'm hoping that you, you can <laughs> help me with this, which, which goes something like this. Um, you can think of art in terms of the object that, that it produces, like a painting, uh, and say, look, you know, art is about you know, producing, let's say, uh, beautiful objects. Or you could say, well, no, 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 it's not about the object. What art is about is opening, um, our eyes to the world, uh, and the object is really not important. It's um, just a means to opening your eyes to, to nature or to, to uh, meteorological phenomena or gestures or, or whatever. I mean, your paintings seem to me to be both um, beautiful in themselves and also um, sometimes very witty and humorous and, and opening but also they're doing this other thing, they're opening us, they're, they're giving us new eyes. I mean, I just wonder if there's a sort of tension between these two uh, goals in art uh, and whether you see that tension in your own work. Well, I, th I think you can also open people's eyes through teaching uh, the, and being a teacher. Uh, I don't think, I think that can't be the only goal of art. Um, and I think it's it's really debatable. I mean, I've I've got some a couple of incredible colleagues here who who do time-based art, mm -hmm. and um, who interact with the community. And um, so, I, you know, I'm an object maker. I always have been, and I love objects. <coughs> and the more objects you have, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so. So what I respond to, um, it, m objects are my voice. I found as a as a, a kid, I was I felt pretty inarticulate with words, and so and I also found I could get better marks on book reports if I did a drawing with them, and I could write less. So for me, it actually th this is my voice. Words are my second language. So, um, I think I got tangled up in that one, no. but, <laughs> but anyway. So your question, your question was, does art need have to be an object? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I mean, are objects 
the end necessary. of the point of art or to produce there are, for some, or are they a window some. onto something else? Oh, yes, mm. both. Well, <laughs> let me ask you then, there's a yes. slightly connected question, which, because um, a lot of a lot of your paintings seem to have um, sort of, they're visually very powerful, but that they're also, there's uh, some sort of symbolic <laughs> dimension to them. And I was thinking about uh, Jung talking about the collective unconscious, which is re really convenient if it were true, that there are, that we all share a whole set of meanings and uh, attached to, s to symbols. Um, so that if, if you um, were to paint using those symbols, you could communicate with people because they'd share your <laughs> meanings. But I, I think on the other hand, an awful lot of the experiences that one has, has are really deeply personal. So I'm wondering, it's, you know, it's the same kind of question. Um, um, your response to the sky, or the way you think about sky, or the way you think about house, or the way you think about fire, um, does it rely, do your paintings rely on other people sharing that same sort of symbolic sense of these things, or, or are, is there a whole range of symbolism that you can draw on? How can, how can art be deeply personal and sort of universal in its power? Well, I th uh, one of the things about my work is that I will, I, I will tell you, uh, like many artists, I'll tell you a certain amount about what the image means, but I really want you to have your own idea and to have your own, it's what, what the viewer thinks is really important to me. Uh, but it's, it's also, there's also a level of meaning in the work that I won't reveal to anybody. It's none of their business. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are there are layers of meaning within a work, and I like using very recognizable, normal, ordinary things in what seems to be a fairly normal situation that you can kind of believe in, but it's highly improbable. It's a bit like the two people playing lawn, bo you know, lawn bowling in front of a blazing cane field, and you know, is you know what's going on here? So it's it's a strange game, but um, so there. I I think it's for me. It's really important to use imagery. It's not. I I couldn't do abstraction if well maybe if you paid me, but. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> I, I'm totally uninterested in doing <coughs> abstraction because the for I use a lot of the the formal qualities, uh, formal issues that painters use when they do abstraction. But there's just not enough idea there for me, and the idea is so important to me to present and and then let you figure out what it might be. You were really perfectly happy with that woman who thought that putting the house in the, the oven was Burn about. It up. Um, yeah. But th then wasn't Shocked. she mis wasn't she missing the point of your painting? Well, I did. I didn't want it to be so obvious that okay. you know I would have. I don't know what I would have done if I'd had a, somebody making a house cake or something. <laughs> that's actually that's an idea. <laughs> but but it's I didn't necessarily. Sometimes I almost don't like, you know, I like to give people a kind of an outline of what I'm up to, but I'd prefer them to, to really come up with their own ideas. And, they're, and the, everybody's lived a different life, read different books, traveled. You know, everybody is going to have a, a slightly nuanced view of a house or, you know, a shoe or whatever. Okay, one last question then about, about Nashville. Because mm -hmm. you've shown us some sort of fabulous uh, artists uh, <coughs> in, in Nashville. And I mean, honestly, some of their work seems to be as good as it gets. Mm. But then I wonder, don't you think there's a big sort of disconnect then between what's fashionable in New York and LA and what is maybe just really, really good uh, locally? And, and could, do you think you could be you know, a great artist in the wrong place at the wrong time? Well, but is, what's wrong? What's well, success? Well, you know, you get into the definition of success. Mm -hmm. If you are 
living in a great place. You're doing wonderful work, work that you don't have to compromise. I don't mm -hmm. have to compromise my images at all. Um, I, the, the New York art scene, is, while it's very vibrant and a lot going on, it's very, very, very political. And uh, it's, like, it's like anywhere. I'm sure mu the music uh, industry here is probably very political. And, and, you know, it's so every uh, pretty, pretty darn well, pretty nearly every single artist has to have a job doing something else. Some of us are in academia. Some of us are doing graphic design. Some of us are art directors. Uh, some are working for museums. Uh, you know, it's just all over the place. I mean, everybody's, all artists have jobs. <laughs> And uh, so, so you know, qu you know, it's quality of life and, and that sort of thing. But um, I, th I don't think this is the wrong place because I think this Nashville is actually becoming recognized. That's how my my gallery, uh, Chicago Gallery, Carl Hammer, came found my work, saw it at the Frisk, and then got in touch with me and said. You know, how about it? Would you like to show in terrific gallery in Chicago? And um, I think you can get out. You know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways of getting out of town. So and you, you've shown that. Yes. yes. <laughs> Wonderful. L let's let's open the question to the floor. And what I would ask you to do is to make your questions succinct and answers succinct, so that <laughs> we get as many uh, people in as possible. Okay. okay? Uh, I appreciate you saying that it's been the artist, uh, I mean the viewer can interpret because I did see in the uh, chain fire that the two cabanas I, I, for, I saw uh, Los Angeles in the fire oh. and all those homes were burned down. But secondly, I, I would love to take this water fast, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a senior and uh, <laughs> I need a little break. <laughs> so did you do anything? No, I don't. I don't. Sorry, Same but uh, so I have seniors in my class, but <laughs> they're a different kind of senior, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Though. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious about this idea of art as communication. Oh. Well, that I, they are seeing most of what, most of what I want them to see, and I work very hard for that, toward that, uh, to communicate the ideas. And, uh, but, but it's not. I mean, pretty much, I like a little mystery. It's supposed to look a little bit like a film still, film noir, maybe. Um, and I don't want to present. I don't want to be too obvious. It's not interesting to me to have you look at it and go, oh yeah, okay, get it, whatever. <laughs> you know, and that's it. But good question. Share with us those thoughts you wish to share about the pie wagon. <laughs> oh, oh, the pie wagon? The, the Nashville pie wagon? Oh, oh, the Pie Wrangler. Okay. Well, that, uh, I decided I wanted to do some really big, juicy desserts and so just <laughs> objects of desire. I just wanted to see if I could do it. And um, so I made, I, you know, I did this big pie and I made the cherry so much bigger and juicier, you know, the, than it would have been on a pie, piece of pie that size. And, the crust crustier and just really kind of uh, almost sinfully de delicious. So I, I kind of sometimes like to kind of draw people in and then, ah, there's a guy hanging off it. So, and is he pulling it down or is it pulling him up? You know, it's it, not entirely sure. Is he, does he have a whole ranch full of those pies? <laughs> you know? So, um, a little bit of humor, a um, little bit of mystery. Thank you. 
Oh, manual. A lot of your work seems to be maybe disconnected from the place or context. At the same time, those same pieces seem very much about a very specific place. Um, can you comment on that a little bit? There, there are, I have done a lot of uh, image research, li uh, like going to, uh, going around Tulsa. Tulsa, as I mentioned, has a lot of Art Deco architecture, and I love architecture. Uh, Wayne and I have been to Morocco for the architecture. We've been to New Zealand for, and to South Beach, Florida. And to see, not for the beach, but to see the Art Deco. And so I've taken the photographs and occasionally I'll use some of that, but I like taking them out of place. Uh, I, um, wherever I am, wherever I live, my work is influenced by my surroundings, by people, my friends, by, by everything. Um, but um, I also like to kind of take it out of context so that it wouldn't be so site specific that people would think, oh yeah, there's the Ryman and you know, that's obviously Nashville or whatever. I mean, the Ryman's great, but I'm just not interested. <laughs> so um, place is really important to me. And occasionally, I'll do something like the Pie Wrangler, where you don't see it, uh, but what, how far up he is. So you don't exactly know where the place is. So I could probably talk about that for half an hour. You don't want that. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Um, I think there are some great illustrators out there. And I think the difference between the kind of art that I do and illustration is that an illustrator is always given a job to do. And it's not their idea. And it's, um, I, I was, I've always dealt with realism somehow. Um, and I've made it more and more real through the years. Um, or seemingly real. If you look, if you look at my work compared to John Bader, who is an amazing photorealist, I am not even close to his form of realism. Uh, I want it to be real enough to have form and weight and uh, light and surface, but I don't really necessarily want to go that to make it look like a photograph. And occasionally I will use photographs as source material, but obviously they're not straight photographs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. One of my colleagues at Vanderbilt. Maybe we'll just do a few minutes uh, questions. So I would like you to address um, the relationship between your work and the cinema uh, and perhaps the motion. Um, I love film, and I've been involved with the Nashville Film Festival. I haven't in the last two years, but I have for, uh, gee, uh, I don't know, 25 years or something, I've been involved with that festival. And even before that, I did, when I was in grad school, I did animation as part of, for my MFA. And um, I, I found it a tedious process. I did cell animation, so it was 24 drawings a second, you know, and it was, you know, I love to draw, but not that many, you know, <laughs> and so, um, and I, I'm still kind of in the back of my mind toying with a little bit of uh, what they call rotoscoping, where you take live action footage and then you kind of draw over the image. You see it on, on commercials here and there sometimes. There's some really good animated commercials now. 
But uh, I love animation. And with when working with the film festival, I would pre-screen all the experimental films and the animated films for many years. And so I'd see everything that came in, and I love film. I took experimental film analysis as a grad student, and I really love to see it whenever I can. I also love films from the 30s and 40s, things, uh, wonderful old black and white films like The Women, and, uh, you know, so just, there are, uh, Busby Berkeley, you know, it's great stuff. And so I feel like a lot of my work does reference film in that it's, you've got, it, as I sort of mentioned before, you have to figure out, it's, it's a sort of a narrative or an implied narrative where you, something's happening and you've got to figure out how did that guy get up in the sky with the pie? <laughs> and, you know, how is it going to resolve itself? So you, you've got to make up your own little story there. So I'm not sure what you mean by provocative. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, it is, actually. Uh, it can be a little saucy at times without going too far. But you notice they're always in sort of 40s or 50s. Usually 40s shoes, 1940s, <laughs> and sometimes 50s outfits. Great, thank you. Um, I, I agree with you completely. And I think it's interesting if you notice how much more visually oriented our culture has become even within the past 10 years. I mean, if you look at some of the, just look at commercials that are, have been on TV, say, 10 years ago, and look at them now. They're amazing. Animation is really on the big upswing. The special effects in the movies, I mean, even even movies like Jul, uh, Julia, what is it? Julia. Julie and Julia, great movie. Um, I, I mean, there's special effects in there as well. You know, it's everything, they're subtle, but there are some incredible special effects movies. But, I mean, they're everywhere. You can see far better and I, I think that's something that's really creeping in. Art is creeping into our lives, everyone. <laughs> so, and it's a good thing to, to see, to be more visually oriented. There are many other countries that are. If you go to Bali, I mean, they're incredibly or visually oriented. It's beautiful. So we, you know, we need to think with our heads and our, our eyes as well. Thanks for this time. Thanks for the speaker. Thank you. Come back next month.